Hey there, Knicks fans. How you doing? It's your boy, John of the Macri, with you for another episode of the Knicks Film School podcast. Here with my co-host, um, I'm going to try not to shout into the mic in this episode because it, it just the, the excitement is palpable. Um, I'm going to rely on my co-host to keep me grounded appropriately. Not too grounded, but just enough grounded. Um, Jeremy Cohen, um, hello. How are you? Welcome to the program. <laughs> Thank you, John. Pleasure to be here. Um, I'm good. You know, um, there are a lot of, uh, I was going to say Knicks fans. I mean, yes, there are plenty of Knicks fans out there, especially if you're listening to this, uh, but a lot of Giants fans out there where uh, right now it's like 5.07 PM. So I actually watched the game. I I watched the game. Yeah. Yeah, Good game. So two reactions that uh, you can have for tomorrow morning, because we're not going to know the final result. First is like the Giants are absolutely going to beat Tom Brady and win another Super Bowl, And it's going to be amazing. Uh, or the other one is I never really wanted to make the playoffs anyway. You know, I wanted a better draft pick and I just, I'm glad for the Washington football team um, to make the playoffs. So congrats to them. So, you know, well, I, I was about to say, isn't this like, it's kind of like the Eastern conference in, um, in the NBA where it's like, you could be the first team, like the wizards last year were the first team not to make the playoffs and they got the 10th pick in the draft. What, what, what if the giants don't make it, do you know what pick they're going to get? Um, it's probably it has to be about like 10th, right? 10th, Ninth? Yeah. Ninth? Okay. I haven't looked at the tankathon for the NFL in a bit. Is there a tankathon? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> There's a tank- tankathon for all four sports, although the MLB one's a lot less important. Well, actually, I mean, MLB and NFL are a lot less important because there's no randomness to it because there's mm-hmm. no draft lottery. Yeah. So, right. um, but yeah, you know. Well, well here, let, game is. that's an interesting, that's, I'm, you just inspired me. I, as, as always, I go off the cuff when, when the, when the feeling hits, um, if anybody had asked either of us a week and a half ago, if we had the option this NBA season to change the lottery rules such that the team that finishes with the worst record, it was it changed the lottery rules to the NFL rules. How quick, what would you, I would have given up, a toe at least and maybe a maybe a pinky finger because do i i mean how much do you really i'm just trying to figure out now nah, pinky finger is pretty important i would have given right. up the- just keep in mind that in like two months you have to hold a live human baby so make sure that you know which finger yeah, but they have shit for that now they have like this thing like the rue you put the kid in the thing and it, it vibrates around and yeah it's but like, the, it, i mean look i'm not a parent but the idea of holding your own child i'm sure I mean, like, yeah, you could put your baby. Are you talking about like the satisfaction I get from it? Yeah, I mean, then there's. I don't give a fuck about that. I well, well, fair enough. That's a good. Um, (laughs) Just just put it out there. Um, Whatever we we I we you would have jumped at the chance. I'm assuming, right? Okay. What to to eliminate the draft lottery and just have? Of course. I mean, well, wasn't that the whole reason that we were hoping for Zion? I mean, we knew the odds, but the idea of like, well, we're going to be. Bad ones will be the worst. So let's to be get the, the worst. Best odds, the fourteen So yeah, you know, chance. and hey, RJ is great, but you know it's in the time Listen, everyone knows it was it was Zion. It was it was Zion, and then it wasn't. It and is RJ, and, and, and that uh, look, and we're going to talk about RJ oh, yeah. um, because I think despite the shooting numbers, uh, um, well, we're going to talk about RJ um, now. If someone gave you the same opportunity, what? What would your reaction? Would, would you be like, "Oh hell no"? Would your reaction be like, "Hold on, let me let me look at some schedules"? What, where what would your reaction be? I would say like, you know what? I could take one year of just flat out mediocrity, getting someone like a Kate Cunningham, and then walking away. Because here's the other factor, right? And this this is where I've kind of gone back and forth with the whole tanking philosophy because as you know i've i've been a, a proponent of it before wait but are you but, but, but in terms of pre, if someone gave you the choice right now are you i'm, I'm asking because do you think they're actually going to finish with the worst record right now no i do not as we said okay so that's where I, I'm even even before towards. the season i didn't think the knicks would finish with the worst record oh see i, I thought it was i thought there was a de- like that's what i was angling towards right. like if you would if you would ask me a week and a half ago i might not have thought they were going to finish with the worst record but I would have thought that they the be, the odds of them finishing with the worst record were better than the were better than the odds of them lucking into the first pick. Oh, 100 percent. Which is because yes, that's can, what I'm getting towards here. It's easier to control your own destiny than taking a chance on it in terms of the lottery. But then if the lottery yeah. is not there, but then you have other teams competing. So, again, like I, in real life terms, because that's all we have to operate 
um, because I was actually asked this. And you might have been part of the the uh, tweet too, but someone said, you know, like Knicks are two and two. Should we be worried? And it's this idea of like, well, we just have so many games left that you do not have to be worried about anything. Things are going to shake out because the reality is also that, you know, if the Knicks want a player, if he's also within a reasonable range for them to trade up, they'll do it. That's not a problem. You know, they tried to trade up for Obi and yeah. clearly that they didn't have to in the end. Um, we also saw them in the offseason. They went after uh, Gordon Hayward and Malik Beasley on long-term contracts. Like, I know I'm getting ahead of myself there too, but it's like, it's not this idea of the Knicks are only willing to commit to where they're situated and they don't want to give out lengthy contracts. No, no, that's not it. They just haven't had the opportunity to get those players for one reason or another. One reason being the Hornets made a godfather offer to Gordon Hayward and he took it. The other being Malik Beasley was a restricted free agent, things like that. So, cause I know that people are thinking about this and I'm thinking about it a little bit too. I mean, I'm focused on this season, of course, but you also have the thought of like, man, the Knicks could really use someone in the half court because as great as things are, the offense is suffering. And if they yeah, had someone who could be more of a floor good. general, that would be fantastic. That sort of thing. And, and, you know, like I see a lot of talk about trading Randall and even I'm a little bit apprehensive about it. And I, you know, I know you and Tom were talking about this too. And um, Touching on it, yeah. just, just the idea of like, you could trade Randall, but look at how well he's playing. You don't have to make that type of move right now. And it's, you don't. It, it's, it is six games. I still struggle with trying to, you know, sort through which percentages are, are meaningful, which maybe aren't. It, it's six it's games, tough. but it's, but, it's a sixth of the way to the trade deadline. That's the other thing. Which, oh, and also it's even closer because a month from right now, is the first day where teams that sign trade, free agents yeah. from other teams are eligible to trade their players. I, and that's that's important. It's just, it's so interesting to me because you, it's so funny. I have stayed off Twitter for a little while now. Um, I, As I hinted at the last time we recorded, I just don't have the time anymore. Um, and you're on it more. And I'm sure there is a lot of dialogue happening about the periphery stuff. Right. And it just strikes me that I wonder, are we, we, I don't know, are we the only fan base in the NBA, but we have to be one of the few that other fan bases start out three and three after just absolutely sucking for as long as we have sucked in the way that we have sucked. And with the magnitude of suckage that we have had, and if they started off like this, the questions would be like, okay, how real is this? Are we actually a 500 team? Are we like close to a 500 team? Or are we just a shitbag masquerading for a week and a half as a decent team? No, no, no. Not in New York. In New York, those questions are secondary. The first questions are like, oh my God, are we fucking everything up by whatever's going on right now. And then we'll worry about secondary, whether it's real or not. And like, my mind isn't there because I'm just so in the moment of like, holy crap, this team looks like it might not be the worst team in the league. And like, which, which is again, why I kind of started where I started, because I think it's, it's just interesting that, you know, a week and a half ago, the, the primary concerns for me, at least, we're like, oh, God, what if we finish last or second or last or third to last and, and we end up with the sixth or seventh or eighth pick? And I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm deciding between, you know, Zaire Williams and uh, and and, uh, you know, Jalen Johnson or so, like, like making a, like six months from now, having the type of discussions on this podcast that I don't want to be having. Right. And now it's more just like, OK, is there actual real stuff going on here and what can we take from it? And um and I'm happy about that. And it's just interesting to me that maybe not everybody is because I don't know. I'm, I, yeah, that's just interesting to me. Yeah. I'm, I'm similar in that, you know, like I don't necessarily look at each game as, Oh, this is going to kill the tank or, Oh, this is going to like, you know, this loss is not going to help in terms of getting to the playoffs, even if you feel they're viable or not, it's a lot more loosey goosey for me. And it's kind of been more enjoyable for, as a fan to just have a very laissez-faire, anything goes attitude because I don't necessarily have to stress over it. Like I was, my natural reaction to last night's game against the Pacers was cheering. And if that was my natural instinct, then that tells me that I clearly am rooting for this team to win games. Um, oh yeah. And you know, I, I think the other important thing to remember, because yes, and I'm sure we'll get into this discussion 
at nauseum and at more in more frequency as time goes on. But I kind of think back to the fact that just in terms of what the jazz were able to accomplish and how a team that had Walt Perrin in the front office that had Johnny Bryant on the coaching staff, they traded up and they got Donovan Mitchell 12th and both a decade after they traded up and got um, Deron Williams, Deron Williams. Right. And so it's that kind of thought process of you can, you can, you can also sell and, and not be sellers. If that makes sense. Like if anything, last night's game said to me, you can actually pull this off without a player like Alec Burks. And that's no disrespect to Alec Burks. Which is unbelievable. Idea of, no, he's so important. He, I was texting right. someone last night. He might, you could argue that other than Randall, he's been their most important player. Exactly. And the fact that the Knicks have been, I mean, that they were able to win in Cleveland without Alec Burks, that they were able to win last night without Alec Burks, it goes to show that there's a resilience there. And it's inspiring. It's and you could argue that if they had Alec Burks against Toronto, you. Listen, I'm not. It's not. Yeah. I don't think it's nuts. They were in that game until midway through the fourth quarter when they literally the entire starting lineup couldn't have shot. So just yeah, throwing that is, out there. This is a theme too. We're seeing through these six games. What I, I'm trying to think if there are any games where in the first half is just an absolute bloodbath. No, no, they've and it they've really had, wasn't. They've hung close or they've been in the lead in the yeah. first half, which says to me, okay, second half, you just need a closer. You need that guy, whether it's. RJ, you know, next year or someone next to RJ who can help. And then you're in a lot better shape moving forward. So, you know, I mean, it's pretty crazy to me how this team could have pretty much the worst three point shooting performance in the history of the NBA, arguably not not hyperbole and still find a way to keep things close until like, you know, it just caught up with them. And then, and and then you got a team, by the way, last night, or uh, as we're recording this last night in the Pacers, who took 53s, and they made 19 of them. Or, sorry, was it 17 or 19? They made a, a good lead. It was either 17 or 19, one or the other. What Either one is like an acceptable percentage, considering the league average three-point percentage is 34%. Um, also, best team in the post in the NBA by a comfortable margin. And they took the thing that they were best at, and they threw it right back in their face, and they said, no, you're not having this tonight. And it's just like, that's impressive on the road against a team that was feeling great about itself. They'd only lost one game to the Celtics and that was a tight one that they gave away in the fourth quarter. So, you know, the ways that the team is winning it, it, it are impressive. And I, we're, we're going to go through some categories of the early season so far, but before and I'll, I'll turn it over to you before we get there. But the last thing I want to say is just, I, I hear everything you're saying, and I know it, you, 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 there's a lot going through your head, so I know what you're saying is not indicative of everything that you're thinking. It's just this is a concern, and it is a concern of a lot of people. Wait, where are we going to get that? Where are we going to get that star? If we don't get the star in the draft, then we got to trade for the star. we got to sign the star, this, that, and the other thing. <laughs> the Knicks are in a different category than every other team in the league and arguably every other team in professional sports, aside from maybe the Jets, in that they are not only a laughing stock within their league, they are a laughing stock nationally. Did you watch Soul yet, Jeremy? I did. Great, my favorite movie of the year. I'm, I really, if um, oh god, I forget his name. The co uh, writer and and co director of the film. I'm going to look it up right now because I um, not Pete Doctor. Um, Was oh the one who wrote the joke? The one who wrote the joke. The one who wrote the joke. Yes. I'm looking it up right now because I apologize. I'm forgetting his name, which is not the best way for me to try to convince him to come on this podcast, which is what I really want. Um, Kent Powers. Kent Powers, if you're listening to this, you are officially invited on the Knicks Film School podcast. You wrote and directed my favorite movie of the year. Anyway, there was a Knicks joke in there for a national movie, right? That is seen in millions of households on Disney+. And you know what? I bet most people whether they are four or 40 years old, got the joke because that's how big of a laughing stock the Knicks have been. And for where the franchise is at right now, all of those other concerns about the the logistics of team building from day whatever we're at until day 1000, those are secondary to just being functional and respectable and competent and all the words we throw around in this podcast. So again, all due respect to any of those concerns and all of the people who are like, ah, it's going to be another situation where we lose out on Luka Doncic for, for Kevin Knox and this and that. Like, I don't want to hear it right now. 
I just don't want to hear it right now. Um, I'm sorry because it's not, that's not what this is about. So sorry. I, I, that was my last little piece I wanted to say. Say what you want, and then we'll get to our, our categories here. Oh, I think that's fair. You know, we're looking at a process here. You build step by step. And as you're saying, yes, the Knicks reputation is lower than dirt in a lot of ways. We're talking about a team that has missed the playoffs seven years in a row, and they're trying to build a foundation and they're trying to build accountability. And look at how much we were clamoring for Emmanuel quickly to come back quickly, who yep. was drafted 25th overall. And that's, that's a testament to the work that they're doing and how excited yeah. we are to see young talent uh, thriving before our very eyes. And, and again, he's only played in two games, one that was shortened in Indiana, the other that was not as short in Indiana. But still, it's that breath of fresh air that, that drives us and that gets us excited for these games. And that's why I care more about the process than I do about the results. The Knicks could have lost that game against Indiana last night. And I would have probably been like, all right, that's unfortunate. But they hung close, you know, compared to the last game, they made the adjustments in the second half that they needed to. And even with Randall shots not falling, he still is playing well. He's finding ways to do things properly. And yet they yeah. did win. And that still was a really rewarding feeling. And it feels like, all of the hard work, all of the changes that are being made, they might seem incremental, but it's going to pay off down the line. And that's really exciting. And so that's why I can't, I can never begrudge fans for rooting for a team to win. Even if you think that tanking is the right way. And sometimes I have felt that way. I still can't say to a fan, like you shouldn't root for the Knicks win because what message is that sending? And how, how do I know that, that the Knicks winning or not winning a game is going to be the difference necessarily? So, especially with these new odds. I mean, with the lottery rules before, just... beforehand, it was maybe a different story. Uh, maybe, but now it's just, it doesn't matter. Again, the seventh overall team, or the team with the seventh best odds has moved up two out of the last two years with the new lottery. So, again, I just let's focus on if we want to talk about asset accumulation, let's talk about a player like how you can keep winning or keep staying in games without having Alec Burks, or maybe it's the type of thing where you don't need someone else who's on the roster because like if it were Julius Randall, you could figure out that means that Obi Toppin has taken a step forward enough to show that as good as Randall is, it's superfluous, but we're not there yet because Toppin's hurt and Randall's playing fantastically. So I'm excited. I, the process is everything to me and it's starting to pay off. <laughs> And you again, like, are we allowed to I, use that word? We're not. Sure. Yeah, we've, you know, might as well. I just, we, I go we have back common, to, we've commandeered the process and we've, we've, we've adopted it. Yeah. The process 2.0. Yeah. But I just, I go back to the Indiana game and the difference of what two weeks can be. And it's awesome to see that. It's really nice to see rewards pay off. It is. Um, listen, the best franchises don't tank. And if you want to tell me, well, the Knicks aren't one of the best franchises. Then it's a then it's a catch twenty two, right? I, I think I'm using that term correctly, because hopefully this is on the way to making us become a better franchise. And you can't become a great franchise until you become a not dumpster fire franchise. Um, and uh, you know, the other advantage that they have, and we have talked about it many times, is that they are well. The advantage that they have had but not used, they're a coastal city one of the four or five destinations in the sport. Um, and they have not been able to take advantage of that for some time. So becoming better, um, whereas it might theoretically shut out an, another team playing in, you know, Kalamazoo from their one chance at a superstar. That is not the case here. So we're, listen, that's, that's enough on tanking. All right. Um, I came up with uh, five categories that we're going to go through one by one. Um, and we have not shared our answers with each other. Uh, biggest surprise, good, good surprise. Biggest disappointment, um, biggest um, uh, trend that's here to stay, or like best trend that's that's here to stay. Um, biggest mirage, um, fool's gold, whatever. And then lastly, the thing that we're most excited about. Um, do you want to you want to kick us off? Sure. So I'm sorry. What was the first one again? With your, your biggest surprise of the season thus right. far positive one okay um i would have to say it's julius randall okay just based i was on anticipating fact, you saying that so i came up with something different excellent yes uh just based on the fact that he looked like a depreciating asset and it seemed like most of the time when when people myself included were talking about randall it was well look on the bright side you know he's only worth four million dollars and a guaranteed deal for the year after that's really nothing it's it's pocket change if you want to swallow it it's not a big deal and he's instead turned into this all-around player. And it, it's been 
beautiful to watch. You know, I mean, there's a great Twitter thread on his off ball defense uh, towards the end of the Pacers, the second Pacers game. Yep. And if you follow him, it's mesmerizing because this is someone who, you know, he's fighting over screens. He's consistently staying with his man. Uh, it's someone where on one particular play, he did such a good job that it was actually Mitch who started to lose. I think it was Turner um, potentially. And, and it was like, is this freaky Friday? Have the roles completely switched? And it was great to see him. And, and the fact that he is able to impact the game when a shot isn't falling because the way he's playing, it feels unsustainable. And yet maybe, maybe he's been reined in enough and he's carved out a role and they've just, dis- they've developed a system and a scheme that can actually utilize his strengths because he has never had a coach like Tom Thibodeau, a Tom Thibodeau, excuse me. And he does have, um, KP in there, the true KP that we acknowledge. The real, the only real KP. The only real KP. Well, yeah. actually, Chris Percy Einan deserves a mention. Of course. Well, I guess I meant more in terms of like official <laughs> member of the New York Knicks KP. But if I had That's to fair. go, yes, I'd say Chris Percy, <laughs> Chris Percy Einan, Kenny Payne, and then um, anybody else. So yeah, Katy Perry even put her there. I love Katy Perry. She's you great. know, she's great. she 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 pumps him out. Yeah. Um. So it's hard not to say Randall because of just how deflating it felt everything was. And he's, he's, he should absolutely be in the uh, conversation for most improved player. If he keeps this up. That's the, well, boy, that award. I mean, yes, but uh, that award is, it's not usually given to a mid-career guy and Randall at this point is a, re- a mid-career guy. That would be fascinating. Um, someone who covers the Pacers um, uh, DM me after the game. uh <laughs> Randall was fucking insane. This game so good. Um, and I said, he's never defended like this, at, like in his life. And he said, that was all defense work right there. Uh, no joke. Sabonis had nothing going. And this is someone who watches Sabonis every night. Um, it's, you know, it's legit. Uh, I, I will say just quickly on Randall before I get to my biggest surprise. I think of the two things that are standing out right now as outliers for his career, the assists and the long distance shooting, the the three point percentage can revert to form, but he's, it's not like he's making six threes a game. He's making 1.8 three pointers a game on 50% shooting. So if you lessen that to just one, three a game, so he's taking 3.7 a game and he's making 1.8, if you just lessen it to like 1.1 or 1.2, he's still in business in terms of what he's being able to do on offense. And the passing, boy, I think that's absolutely legit because he is, if anything, overpassing still, which is leading to a lot of the turnovers. He's second in the league in turnovers. I think there's a chance that he could get even more comfortable with the right passes he's supposed to make. And Tim didn't even talk about that in the postgame. Um, you know, the execution, the you know, on those. So kudos to Julius Randle. My biggest surprise is Mitchell Robinson, not necessarily in how he's played, but he is averaging 27.8 minutes per game. Nerland's Noel is averaging 15.1 minutes per game. If you would have told me those numbers would have been inverted before the season, I'd be like, man, that sucks. I really was hoping Mitch would come out and establish the tone and, and at least be Noel's equal, maybe a little bit better, but it wouldn't have shocked me if anything, if you were to like, it's the minutes are 28 to 15 pick who's getting the 28 and who's getting the 15. We're like, well, it kind of sucks, but I guess Noel is getting the 28. It's the other way around. And not only has Mitch outplayed um, Noel, Mitch has outplayed Noel by a significant margin. I would say the only area that I would say Nerlens is ahead of Mitch is he's been able to get out a little bit more on the perimeter, which is, I would argue as much a scheme thing because Tibbs clearly wants uh, Mitch to stay closer to the paint and he's letting Noel roam a little bit more. So there may be a comfort zone thing, but I've just been really surprised at how Mitchell Robinson has established himself and separated himself in this, um, whatever this center competition, if you want to say, and talk about things I think are here to stay. I don't think that's reverting back to form at all. I'm with you. Yeah, you can see the development almost at a gamely basis. And it's beautiful. You know, I mean, there was, um, I guess if we, if we want to have the Pacers game, 
just his sheer presence around the rim with the tippins consistently, oh, yeah. the lobs. He was a, a nightmare for Indiana. Um, and then, you know, I talked about the negative in that one play towards the end, but uh, there was one thing that really caught my eye, which like he applied so much fantastic pressure. I think it was against Brogdon on the baseline uh, defensively where um, it looked, it looked almost like um, they're trying to ice and the way that he kind of forced a cross court pass because his, his defense was just that good where the way he was yeah. handling his body, it just, those types of things where you can see the instincts go because we know that he has that raw potential. It's a matter of how it manifests well, on the court. The block three and that was the steel course, and that like that sealed the game again. There's, there's, Three guys in the league that could do that. I don't, you know. Yeah, it's, it's like him, Ben Simmons, maybe one other person. I just it's it, but yeah, it's but, hard to even make a list. Right, yeah. exactly. It, like that's I can't even think of the third person. That's how and you and you gave that guy to this coach now, yeah. and I think we're starting to see to see the um you know the rewards. Um, so that'll go towards biggest disappointment. Um, again, I'm not going, I'm not going obvious here. Cause I think there's a more obvious one, but I will go with the, this is a genuine answer for me. Uh, my biggest disappointment, I can't believe I'm saying this is Dennis Smith jr. Because I was thoroughly convinced of two things heading into the season one, that his issues were 95% in his head. And two, I thought that the staff, the coaching staff would, get through to him in a way to sort of correct those things. And I thought also the fact that this is a contract year and I think DSJ cares maybe about getting, getting, trying to get that bag. Um, I thought we would, we would see Dennis Smith Jr. Come out and like win the starting job. I thought he would play well and it's easy to blame it on injury. He's only played the one game, but I'm not blaming it on injury because he looked like a guy who had never run an offense before in preseason. And so, um, yeah, I would say that that is my personal biggest, uh, biggest disappointment. Yeah, I get it. You know, I mean, I wasn't quite as you were not as on Dennis <laughs> Jr. as you were. Just um, say it. Just fucking own it. It's, it's like you shove it yeah. in my face. It's fine. Um, you know, I I think everything that you wrote in your newsletter was full of shit. And uh, no, <laughs> it was the thing with, with me with DSJ where it's like, all right, I I'm skeptical. I I just see him as the same player. I can see him getting playing time if he really asserts himself in practice and preseason. Didn't really happen. I, for me, he's more just like salary. You move in a trade to make something work if you have to. Um, At this point, yeah, because he ain't yeah. getting like who? What is he in the rota- Is he the thirteenth man in the rotation right now? I mean, honestly, is <laughs> no, there, I'm not is even being there, see, it, No, I agree, but is yeah, there a compelling it, reason to play him ahead of Jared Harper? Or Theo Pinson, that's not, we're trying to up his value for the trade deadline reason. I'm, forget about Harper. I mean, just if you count the guys who um, are injured right now, I mean, it's just I'm looking at the list real quick. Barrett, Randall, Bullock, Robinson, Burks, Peyton, Toppin, again, assuming everybody's healthy, Knox, Rivers, uh, Noel, that's 10, quickly 11, Frank, 12. So Dennis Smith Jr., highest would be 13th. Yeah. And one thing I've been wondering, and and this is obviously not the first time that this conversation has occurred, um, but the idea of swapping DSJ for Monk comes back to my mind, especially considering how Malik Monk has yet to appear in an NBA game. And this season, yeah. Right. And it's so it's kind of like, well, if you're going to have someone who's struggling in New York and can't really play even when he's healthy, um, sending him to where he's from, North Carolina make some sense. And then sending the guy who went to Kentucky, who's not seeing any action whatsoever, mm. makes sense to send him. Actually, to UK I forgot he NBA. went to Kentucky for a second. All right. So again, like, you know, this is not a significant move. It's the type of deal where it's like, well, like neither of these guys is going to make the rotation anyway. So it doesn't necessarily matter. Um, and the Knicks do have the point guard depth. If you account for Harper and Pinson, um, you know, that, that sort of kind of popped into my head recently. No, but, that's, that's an interesting one. What, um, what's your, what's your biggest disappointment? So it's going to be, this might be a cop out of an answer, but my biggest disappointment is honestly injuries because oh, wow. okay. we've seen almost half of the roster get hurt early. Um, and the thing is, that's just like, that just happens in the NBA. When you start seasons, guys get banged up. They, in the flow of the season, things work out. Um, but a lot of times, just adapting back to an NBA schedule, especially since for some players, they played 
four months ago, five months ago. Uh, for others, they haven't played really in 10 months. So it's tough to manage that and, and get back into the swing of things. And every year, especially ACL tears, um, injuries can occur more fre- frequently in the cor- first quarter of the NBA season. Um, and it, it also kind of opens up because there's a, an, a different dialogue about how, um, obviously we've heard with Tibbs and how players are used and the minutes loads. Look, I, I can't with this. There's no, I just, I, 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 just, I, 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 just, I can't. Yeah. I, 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 no I want you to say what you're going to say. I just, it, this is the most absurd I want you to talk about it, but yeah. I just want to note it for the record. This is the most absurd, waste of time, nonsense conversation for people. Like, I thought of an analogy that would get me canceled, so I'm not going to say it, but I'll share it with you after the podcast is over. Sounds but it's good. like, it's like, oh God, it's like having something really, really, really great happen to you. And then afterwards, you're like, oh, that was over too quick. That stunk. You know, I just want to give it all back. Um, No, no, just be happy. The the guy's playing the best players, the minutes he's playing, playing 48 minutes a game, averaging 37 and change. Come on. It's the same shit as Damian Lillard and CJ McCollum averaged last year. And those guys are smaller and older and higher usage players. I'm sorry. I just, I, this is absurd. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I mean, there's no evidence that shows that playing someone 38 minutes per game significantly puts them more at risk than say 32 minutes per game. It, it just does not exist. And it's the sort of thing where, you know, yes, all of these guys are getting hurt, but it's not necessarily because of, of, of an insane thing with minutes. Like take Spencer Dinwiddie, for example, Spencer yeah. Dinwiddie tore his ACL partially. Um, and he played in the games leading up to the third game of the season when he was hurt, he played 20 minutes, 29 minutes. And then when he got hurt, he was playing, he'd played 15 minutes. That's not because of minutes being logged. That's just because of an injury that happened. It's freak injuries. That's the thing. If you say that Tibbs playing these other guys such an exorbitant amount of time puts them further at injury, it's, it's, an, it's arguing in bad faith for a ridiculous conversation because you can get hurt within the first few minutes of a season. Julius Randle fucking broke his leg in the first game of his rookie season. And it wasn't because of minutes and it wasn't because it's it just, it's it, also it's asinine amusing. to me to argue about it because it it's just, it's just like I said, it's arguing in bad faith. And you know, if, but it's also, if also they weren't first, in, if they weren't first and exactly, right. do you want to like, play to win or do you not want to play? Who's win backing up Julius Randall while Obi Toppin is on the shelf from an injury from a calf strain, the first game of his rookie season. Who's going to back him up? You're not going to have Kevin Knox in there when Julius Randle's going off. He's playing 44 minutes against the Cavs, and you know what? They got the win, John. They won. Like, that's why you keep him in there. I can understand for the Raptors game, right? Maybe when things started to slip away and there was a moment where Julius got hurt. I'll, I'll and hear like, that. I'll right, hear that, that To me, that's, yeah, absolutely. And maybe, you know, I understood why they, t- they kept him in for the free throws because if they took and him out. And then they took him out. Right, but if they took him out before the free throws, then they couldn't put him back in because yeah. he would he would not have been allowed to come in. And I get the argument too of like, well, he shouldn't have been in the first place. Absolutely. But for games that are slipping away, empty your bench. That's fine. For games that are close, why on earth would you say, well, I played this guy maybe two to three minutes more than I quote unquote should have. But that's, that's the thing that annoys me is their first and second in minutes as we record this right now. If they were fifth and eighth and the difference in minutes per game was amounted to a minute or a minute and a half, the conversation, what I imagine the conversation is, because again, I'm not participating in this nonsense, um, would be a lot more, um, you know, muted. And it's, uh, it, I'm sorry. Okay. Can we move on? I, I can't. Yeah. But again, I think the injuries, it's a shame that so many of the players have been robbed of time, but on the other hand, it also showcases what these guys are capable of doing. You know, like yeah. Austin Rivers, obviously you wanted to see what he could do before, but now you're seeing what he can do uh, one game, sure, but you're seeing what he's able to accomplish in the absence of other players. And it also makes that contract look like even more of a steal, which oh, it is because it. it's just great. So um, I'm going to go with injuries on that one. So that's your greatest disappointment. Um, well, we have three more. Next one up is, oh, the 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 good trend that is here to stay. Uh, I believe it is your turn. We're doing snake draft style here. So what, what's yours? Sure. Um, I'm going to say the good trend that's here to stay is probably the frequency at which the Knicks shoot at the rim and in corner threes. Ah, yes. 
Did it's I good, steal what you're I, gonna I, say? I, I no, I it was not mine, but there was a paragraph or a line in my newsletter on Monday. I, I want it to be known that it was there before you just said that because I had that. Well, it, John, it's an honor for you to copy what I'm saying right. verbatim, but this is, I can't, I can't, I can't um, work with this. this the is, fact this. is that the Knicks are second in shots at the rim and fourth in corner threes in terms of their frequency. Uh, their accuracy is not nearly as good. They're 28th no. at the rim and 11th on corner threes, but it drives home the philosophy. And Tibbs has been talking about this since he was hired. Even, yep. even I think before then he, the lead up, he was talking about just the importance of taking these shots that are high level at the rim and the corner three, because that's the best spot from the three to take it. Um, and it's great to see. It's amazing to see this team step into the 21st century in terms of the analytics, especially from the offensive point of view. It's so that damn time it is, uh, you know, the fact that it's 28th at the rim, that's not great. You would hope to find better finishers. I think Noel having stones for hands, Evan Ingram hands kind of like, maybe he's not the it's best equipped blow. at helping. Well, low blow. I can say it. Um, you know, that sort of thing where uh, he needs to improve. I don't know how you necessarily improve that at the age of, I think, 26 for Noel. Um, for the other guys, you know, finishing, it's important. And there seems to be some signs of getting better, but um, 28th ain't it. So it'll be something to work on. But for now, they're building that system and that scheme. And I love it because just they're listening to the math and the math works. Yeah, I uh, and a couple other things just on the offense while while it's on my mind. Uh, some low hanging fruit. They are eleventh in offensive rebounding rate right now, which sound, which is is high. I think they could get a lot higher just because of the way their team is built. Um, and they are uh, very. They're also do do do. 29th in turnover rate. Um, the only team that is below them in turnover rate is Miami, who is experimenting with a starting lineup in which they do not have a uh, point guard who was ever or anybody who has ever played point guard full time before because they're shoehorning in uh, Tyler Harrow into the starting lineup right now. And that is a, you know, a growth process. Granted, we are essentially, you know, having Julius Randle be our point guard. So I guess it, my point is that that should improve as well. Um, 17th and free throw rate, the other, other than corner threes and shots at the rim, the other one you want is free throws 17th, not great, but also not bad. Um, they're also fifth in drives, by the way. Yes. So, to me, that says they're just not really getting a lot of calls quickly, obviously is, but, um, maybe having someone who can sell it a little bit more on those drives since that's what they're doing. That yeah. could be a factor. Yeah, no, for, for sure. I think, I, I think that number will go up. Uh, my good thing that's here to stay is the assist rate. Uh, it's 12th in the league right now for context, uh, the last time the Knicks finished outside of the bottom 10 in assist percentage was 2014-15 when they finished ninth. Um, and uh, last year, the last two years, they have less assists than anyone in the league. So the fact that they are 12th right now, I think is significant. I think it's here to stay because everybody to a man during these like media interviews has said that Tibbs said from day one, like if you're not going to pass the ball, you're not going to play. Um, and if anything, there has been overpassing going on because it is just being clearly drilled into these guys' heads, make the, make the right play, make the right play. And I think what's the other Tibbs line? Um, it's not the, or when he was like being asked about like whether he's okay with the team taking so many threes after the Toronto game, he's like, it's about making the right play. Like he's clearly, clearly driving this home. So um, and it's not like they don't have guys who are good passers. Like Julius Randle for the at the four is a good passer. RJ for the three is a good passer. The only one who's a suboptimal passer is Mitchell Robinson. And it's again, I we both believe there's some meat on that bone. Um, whether he whether he gets there, we'll see. Uh, Alec Burke's good passer for his for the wing. So it's yeah, a little I, bit less so, but you know. Yeah. But uh, whatever. <laughs> Whatever at this point. I mean, look, we we do what we can here. Um, okay, so that's my good thing that's here to stay. Um, now for my mirage or my um my fool's gold. This hurts me, especially since this is the focus of my newsletter for Monday. Um I think the defense is gonna come back down to earth. I think they're there. I was that yours? The shoe is on the other foot. I yeah. I mean I wasn't gonna put this on the newsletter, but yes, I we'll see where the difference lies. So they're eighth in defensive rating right now. Um, 
they are still the best team in defending uh, the three, which is to say that teams are hitting fewer three pointers against them than they are against anybody else in the league. Um, here, here's what I will say. I don't think this is going to crater. I think this is going to come down to like the mid teens, 15, 16, 17, something like that. Because of it, you know, here, here's the thing. Tibbs philosophy, which is that you're not getting anything at the rim, which has been a work in progress in its own right, but you're, we're going to give up threes. Um, we're, we're, we're just going to try to get hands and faces. A, there will be more hands and faces as the year goes on because guys will get better at the rotations. Um, and um, I think more importantly, he believes that the math will work out in your favor eventually. And I think that's why we've seen some of the best and most sophisticated defenses in the league over the last several years specialize in a type of defense that gives up a ton of threes. Um, So this is not revolutionary. This is not necessarily outside of the box thinking. This is like, you can't take away everything. We're going to take away stuff at the rim. Um, You're going to get some threes and we think we're going to make you uncomfortable enough. Um, And I think they're going to get better at it. That said, like, they're not going to be the best three point defense in the league for the entire year. So how far they fall, I don't know, but I think they will, will fall. I fun fact was compiling some research this afternoon. Okay. I was like, Oh, well, you know, I, I have not for whatever reason, listened to the most recent KFS pod with John and Tom. So I better put that on. And as I've compiled all this information, then Tom introduces the fact of, wide open threes and teams not converting. I'm like, all right, yeah, there we go. There it is. So <laughs> not to um, beat a dead horse. I apologize. No, there's on behalf of Tom and myself. You know, the fact that Tom's on board now, you just have to can him. I'm sorry. I'm making the executive decision, Tom. It's nothing <laughs> personal. It's just, you beat me to the punch. Um, hired, fired. So the Knicks this season have allowed 145 wide open three pointers. That's the Ooh. second most That's in the league. Um, They've also limited opponents to having the lowest field goal percentage from three. But here's the crazy thing. Uh, Caitlin Cooper, who covers the Pacers, she said the Pacers shot 37% on 24 wide open field goal attempts against the Knicks, whereas the Knicks shot 50% on eight tightly contested field goal attempts against the Pacers. That's not three. That's just in general, but that should give you somewhat of an understanding. So when you dig a little bit deeper, uh, in the two games against the Knicks, the Pacers have shot 14 of 47 on wide open threes. That's 29.8%. Yeah. However, in all other games, they've shot 26 of 68, which is 38.2%. That would be about league average for those four other games. On wide open threes. Correct. The Bucks, yeah, okay. the Bucks took 25 wide open threes in that game against the Knicks. 25. They connected on six. Six of them. It's not 24%. What you want. No, it's not. The Bucs allowed the most wide open threes in the NBA last year uh, and allowed the 12th worst percentage at 37.5. And there were several factors for why the Bucs lost the heat in the playoffs. But a big one was that because they let up so many um, threes that were open, Miami converted and they shot 45.6% in that five game series, knocked out the Bucs and went on to the NBA finals eventually. Because when you see a team night after night after night, it's easy. It, it's not as much of a shock to the system. Correct. Which the Bucks are when you see them once every you know month or two. So. Right. Now, this season, the Bucks have attempted the third most wide open threes per game, and they have the third highest percentage on such shots. If you take out that Knicks game, they're at 48.2%, which would be first in the NBA. And then finally, yeah. the Cavs shot four of 24 on threes that were wide open against the Knicks. That's 17%. Take out that game, 35 of 80 that's almost 44%. That would be fourth in the league. So yeah, Knicks the, Knicks, the Knicks are just getting, yes, exactly. They're, they're getting very lucky, um, which is okay, you know, because teams can have off shooting nights. The night after the Knicks had their miserable performance against Toronto, the Heat, I think, went like 0 for 14, 0 for 15 against Dallas. Yeah, uh, they, started, uh, they, three. yeah they started the game out 0 for 14, yeah. And it was putrid, but Dallas just caught them on an off night. And as a result, that won them the game, uh, much to the chagrin of Knicks fans. So that's the thing. You know, it's, it's a process. I agree with you. Even just, um, in my opinion, getting to like 
above a, a bottom 10 defense, that to me is significant I, progress. And I, I think, think that the goal should be top 15. I agree. Top half oh, of the league. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the goal. the goal should be first. But in the idea of like <laughs> where they are at in terms of this process, I can live with getting out of the basement among terrible defenses and getting closer to like that 15 to 20 range. That'd be for 15 to 19 in this case. That'd be great. Anything higher. Love it. Do I it. think re- realistic goal, 15th defense, um, 25th offense. And I'm not sure which is more unrealistic. Um, <laughs> both would be fairly miraculous. I think the offense is more unrealistic at this point. You don't think they could be better than five teams? Oh, uh, oh, in that case, yes, I do. But 20, I don't, yeah, again, 25th. I don't know if they have, I don't know if they have the personnel to necessarily do it. You I actually saying, think, like, I actually think the defense staying top 15 in defense, I think that's actually more unrealistic. I think, I think they could figure out a way to score more points per 100 possessions than, I mean, right now they're, according to cleaning the glass, they're 25th. They're ahead of OKC, Toronto, Miami. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, Minnesota and Golden State. You know, but they're also like a shade behind Detroit. They're a little bit behind Cleveland. But that's why I think it really depends on the personnel because yeah. let's face it, like that Toronto game, that starting lineup that they ran out, in my opinion, was worse than the lineups we would tend to see in like the Fisdale era. And that was the worst lineup spacing wise in the NBA. Like they're even stats no, it was, to back it that was, up. It was bad. You know, like I, I, we can love Mitch, but we can also talk about the fact that like even Taj would, would step out of the, the paint to take shots. And that just limits you. Um, and when you have other guys who all come crashing earth or regressing to the mean or Bullock just having a terrible game, that's going to happen. You're going to, I think it was like what? Oh, for 23. So the starting lineup. So, and Bullock was over not, it's like it put, there is so much pressure on Bullock and Burks to make essentially every open three. Yeah. That they and that's really hard for them to do. It, yeah, no, of course, it's hard. That's why you then talk about the idea of subbing in quickly for Peyton, but I guess we're not there yet. So as a result, you just kind of shrug along and you hope that Burks or Bullock has a great game and that RJ makes a three or two and you chug along. Yeah, no, that, that's, That's well said, which um, gets us to our final category, and we'll get out of here. The thing that we are most excited about moving forward. Do you want to take this one, or do you want me to go first? I want you to give you the choice. I'm not, I'm not 100 percent sure which one I want to pick just yet. So I'll okay. So I'll say, Um, I am most excited. um, I did not go outside the box on this one uh, about Emmanuel quickly moving forward because. I think there is, what's the saying? Luck is when skill, talent meets opportunity. Something like that. I know, I know the expression you're talking about. I, I think that's what it is. is. I'm sure if I got it wrong, many people will remind me, except I've been not going on Twitter, so maybe I won't see it. Uh, maybe I'll glance just to see if anybody reminds me of that. Um, it's when whatever. preparation meets opportunity. Sure. Yeah, that works. Okay. Sure. Um, well, even better, right? Because Emmanuel quickly is one of the, by all accounts, one of the hardest workers came into camp in great shape. Um, he clearly is going to have opportunity to play here, whether he starts, whether he averages 25 minutes, whether he averages 20 minutes, I can't imagine he's going to average less than 15. I actually would peg him at 15 for a while uh, if I had to guess, but I think it's going to go up. I like the set of skills that he's already showing between the floater game, the foul drawing, the shoot, the outside shooting and the defense, like Alfred Payton gets a lot of credit for his defense and he does some good stuff on defense, but man, I think, I think quickly he's flat out better as a rookie. I think he's a better defensive player already than Alfred Payton. Um, so I think he's going to have a chance to shine and I just, there is a verve. And I said this in the preseason and we saw it again last, last night against the Pacers. There is a verb that, verb that the offense has when quickly is in the game. And it is just positively delightful. And um, he is, I, I can't, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I have to say this. We would get so excited. We had so little to be excited about over the last three years. 
So what would he, would we get excited about? We would get excited when Frank checked into the game, right? And Frank would do a thing. He would maybe score a basket or he would get a steal or he would like dig from the three point line into the paint to try to prevent the drive. Um, or God forbid he did multiple of those things in the same game. And we would be shouting from the rafters or hanging from the rafters. Sorry. Shouting from the rooftops, hanging from the rafters. Um, Quickly comes in and he does lots of things like all at once. And like, this is like the, 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 all the people who got excited about Frank fans over the last three or who got mad at Frank fans over the last three years, because like, what are you getting excited about? There's really not that much here. Like th- there's actually beat on the bone now. Right. And um, I'm sorry I had to make that comparison, but it's listen, if the shoe fits and this is, this is, this is legit. It feels like a real guy. And I just, I want to see where it goes from here because I, I think the kid's really good and I think he's going to get better and I think he's going to get a chance to show what he has here. So Emmanuel quickly, here we go. It also helps as well with the difference between the two is the, where they're drafted affects your expectations massively. And so, you know, like, and this happens with Mitch too, right? Like if you drafted him 10th, you'd say, well, I would, would like him to be a little bit further along but you drafted him 36th. And now that's incredible value that you got out of an early second round pick. Yep. So for Emmanuel quickly, it just feels like it's manifested even more at 25. Uh, but I agree with you. It's, he's awesome to watch. Um, I think it's a perfect example. And I don't want to go too far out of the box in terms of future assets. Cause we have plenty of time to talk about that. So in the here and now it's never too early. I'm going to actually talk about Austin rivers <gasps> and the fact that I love Austin. He's, he's, you know, he's like, so wonderful. Anyone who wears the number eight, who's not, I guess, Aaron Aflalo, that's something to love. But numbers aside, I think that what um, what Rivers was able to do, just as a leader, asserting himself, especially after, I guess he did play in that game. So it was the second game in Indiana, right? Because yeah, but it felt like that was it felt like the Indiana right. game was his, his coming out party. Exactly. You know, just having that player on the court who knows how to make the right reads. He can hit that step back three has some he, onions, he, some sizable absolutely. onions. Yeah. What, what would you give? Drive. What would you give to see the Sam Cassell dance from Austin rivers once this year? I would pay a goodly sum of money and not insignificant sum of money. Sure. I would, I would match that because yeah, it'd be great to see anyone listening who knows Austin, the rivers family, maybe, I don't know. Doc, maybe you know Doc. Get this message where it needs to go. If Austin would like to earn a little extra cheddar on the side, he's only making three and a half mil this season, so he could probably use it. You know, we, I, me and Jeremy could probably cobble together a hundred dollars between us. Just one big balls dance. That's all we ask for. Just one. I'm sorry, I had to continue, please. <laughs> yes, I'm with you. Um, I think the other thing as well with what that Instagram message was because. You know, like you could brush off, be like, all right, cool. It's just a player who is focused on the team getting the right track. But to me, it was like, they clearly know that this is a coach's son. And you want people who are disciplined and who, who have that, that acumen and that pedigree. I mean, this is also someone who went to a, a Duke, right? I mean, he went to a, a blue chip school. It's, yeah. it's important to have these types of people in your building, especially when the lows are low and just watching him play is really enjoyable, especially because of the role that he's in. Um, Maybe he even becomes a starter. Maybe he takes over in that role, or maybe he just thrives off the bench in a sixth man role. (laughs) However you want to look at it. It's almost this calming presence that he has um, where he can be that leader. And he's not even, he's not an old leader. He's older. Sure. But 20, what is he? 28? It's like 28 years old. Right. So you're not going to these guys who are, you know, like we can love Taj Gibson, but we can also recognize the fact that he couldn't still play that unsigned, well. by the way. I know. Unbelievable. I, know. I guess. I mean, you know, in this day and age, he's great. But th- like, this is the thing with Rivers. You don't necessarily need to go out of your way to sign a yeah. vet type player who has trouble playing. You can yeah. sign a good veteran. And pay him. Who could actually help you win games. Right. And that's where Austin Rivers <laughs> and comes pay in. And pay him that's a third of the price. Exactly. And on a non-guaranteed contract. And on a non-guaranteed contract. contract. So, so that sort of thing where I'm really excited to see how he Steve builds Cole. with this team. Because 
some fans could say like, well, that's a great contract to trade. And sure it is, but that's also a great contract to keep and a great player and a person to keep. So um, I'm really glad that he's back and healthy and uh, it's really exciting to watch him. And it's also fun to see quickly and rivers together. That's cool too. I'm so happy you ended with rivers. I loved that Instagram post. I loved, loved, loved that Instagram post. That made me so happy. Um, and I just am looking forward to having all kinds of irrationally high takes on Austin Rivers moving forward. And I am not going to be held responsible for any of them um, if they come back to bite me in the ass. So just want to just want to note that um, I just decided before we go, we should make it a weekly tradition to predict because we did this two weeks ago. We predicted what their opening 10 games record would be. Right. And you predicted three and 10. I predicted four and or sorry, three and um, seven. I predicted four and four and six. So I'm obviously going to win that. Um, throwing that out there. Um, let's. So they I play. I don't know. <laughs> well, listen. Um, they're through six games, so they have to win one of the next four. So this will be a perfect segue. Um, they will play four games before we record again because we'll we'll. Uh, I'm guessing record after the Denver game next Sunday because it's six o'clock start. So the next four games they have are at Atlanta. Um, and then they have a three game homestand against Utah, who seems to all always beat us by 20 um, Oklahoma city who has two wins, but has struggled at times to put it politely. And then uh, Denver. And th- again, those last three games are at home. So, I could go first if you want in terms of prediction. I, I predict that I my opening prediction of four and six after 10 games will come true and that they will win one of the next four games. That is what I will say. I think that they are going to go two and two. Spice wow. things up a bit. Yeah. I mean, part of this is... Um, That's big. Part of this is, is self-involved. So... For what it's worth, I have the Knicks over it's self-involved, but I also have the Hawks under on the season. Um, you and can tear that up. And one of my well, not necessarily. I mean, they lost to Cleveland. Who, well, yes, they're I, thriving, I but in the long run, you know. So um, I thought. Can I say I thought their their the easiest over under bet on the board was the Hawks under because I was like, there's no way this is a 500 team. That's and what I, I thought. Yeah, and, and it's still well, it's still possible. Um, I guess also, yeah. You know. Yeah, a really good friend of mine's a Hawks fan, so I'm sure we're gonna have a, a side wager on that. Um, and then, you know, I think that they, I think that they could pull another one out in between the Jazz, the Thunder, and the Nuggets. The Nuggets are struggling mightily, um, so you know maybe they turn it around elsewhere. Because I mean, we're talking about how they were an incredible home team, but they're not playing at home, and there aren't any fans in the stands in Denver anyway. Um, the Thunder, yes, they play close games, but I think that. One of those games is winnable. One of those jazz games you talked about, I was present for. It was awful. Was that the one last year? It was two years ago when they just blew the doors open at MSG. It was awful. Just so the game, the jazz games that I remember that stick out were the game, the the jazz game in MSG last year, which like wasn't a like they were like it was technically a game in the fourth quarter, but not really. And then there was the game. I think it was on. It was in December of nineteen twelve of eighteen nineteen season, but that wasn't the home game. I don't think the home game I went to was in that eighteen nineteen season. Uh, the Jazz won one thirty seven to one sixteen. Okay, that was I'm miserable I'm talking- to sit through because they, they started the first quarter thirty nine twenty five, and I was like, all right, well, this is definitely going to be a loss. And then it just grew and grew and grew to the point where <laughs> I think, well, if I'm doing the math correctly, and I'm probably not. I think the Knicks had 79 points after three quarters and the Jazz had like 121, no, 111. So it was it was not a fun game to be at. Okay, the game that I'm thinking of, yes, this is the game I'm thinking of. December 29th, so about two years ago, they lost to Utah 129 to 97 in a game that was not that close. <laughs> This game, yes, this game. Oh my God, JB, um, JB and his lovely wife came to watch that with me and my w- lovely wife. Um, and the score at halftime was uh, eighty-one to thirty-four. 
That is the game. Or sorry, excuse me. It was uh, 71 to 34. 71 to 34. Yeah. That was 2019 it happened? Or the end of that was two. That was December 20... Uh, what did I say? December 29th of 2018. Right. And because I think that was also the game where Frank threw down the hammer on Gobert. And I was like, all right, that's the only thing yes, that we it really was. have yeah, to look forward to in this game. Um, so this team absolutely kicks our ass. <laughs> But you know what? They don't have Johnny Bryant anymore. No, so. they don't have Johnny Bryant. That's true. They do not have Johnny Bryant. And they're better coached. They don't have David Fisdale in New York anymore. So, again, I, you know, maybe it won't be that one. I'm going to say they go two and two between now and the time that we next speak, which after the Nuggets game will be a post game recap as well. So that'll be fun. Yeah, no, um, it would. It would. Oh, God. It would be so lovely. If we could see, if we could be sitting here talking about a 500 team again a week from now. Oh, just uh, all the feels. chef's kiss. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jeremy, this was as always, it was just absolutely phenomenal. Um, anything uh, from you before we get out of here? Uh, reluctantly fly Eagles fly. Cause the Eagles we'll see not look at, I'm not, I don't have any faith in them, but we'll see. So uh, yeah. I and if they, rel- again, if they don't win, then uh, I always want to nice traffic. Joke. Um, I had to rely on Jalen Hurts last week in a in a fantasy uh, Super Bowl, and I thought when he unloaded that uh, eighty yard touchdown pass to Deshaun Jackson in the first quarter, I'm like, man, I might have a chance in this. I, I did not. He didn't have a terrible game, but I, I I did not win. It was not enough for me to for me to pull it out. Um, but such is life. Um, everybody out there, uh, thank you for listening to another episode of the Knicks Film School podcast. We'll be back with you. Um, with another episode, I believe, uh, dropping on, on Wednesday. That is, uh, I should say, moving forward, um, the intention, best intentions, um, are, is going to be to have episodes drop on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, we're going to try to stick to that as much as possible. Um, if there should be weeks where we only have two episodes, you could probably count on it dropping Monday and Wednesday or Monday and Thursday, maybe mo- Monday and Friday. But um, the goal from here on in three episodes a week, um, there certainly is enough to talk about. So, uh, yeah, I think that's it. Everybody have a great week and we will talk to you soon.